So again, good evening to everybody and welcome back to the continuation of our 67 Zoom series. Uh, I'm Larry Ricketts for those who have not met me and I hope you had a restful and family filled holiday. Tonight we'll hear from our sport captains. We had a unique set of coaches as mentors who complemented our other mentors at Williams. During the breakout, we'll have a chance to talk about those other mentors, but I will get you thinking about them when I mention Fred and Manny Copeland, that were two of my mentors. Fred traveled throughout the United States and sought out many of us who were in public schools. He was an initial friend and mentor to many of us on this screen. Uh, and then Manny Copeland helped many of us find careers and jobs through the placement center. So. They were sort of bookend mentors for many of us at Williams. Before I introduce Ted McPherson, who will provide a wonderful and unique look at the strength of athletics at Williams from our time up until today, I wanna to take a moment of personal privilege to highlight a friend, a fellow classmate, and as Rick accurately said, an athlete who passed away earlier this week. I met Andy Cadeau during our undefeated freshman baseball season. I'd never witnessed an athlete who literally attacked every phase of the sport of baseball with such love of the game. He ran onto the field, he ran to the batter's box, he attacked ground balls in a way I'd never seen before. And he attacked life in the same way. Andy and I laughed and laughed our way through sophomore, junior and senior years with Coach Coombs. Coach Coombs would yell as we took the field for practice. I don't know why they picked on Andy and myself, but he had that smoker's cough because he smoked a pipe. He'd yell, <laughs> hey, Andy, <laughs> hey, Ricky, great to be alive. Every time Andy and I talked or saw each other, we greeted with great to be alive. My dear friend, save me a place on the field of dreams with Holdridge, Kylie, Mosier and the rest of the gang. So now, Ted McPherson, Thanks, Larry. you're welcome. So now, Ted McPherson, captain of the baseball team, will talk about athletics at Williams and Coach Coombs. Ted is uniquely qualified to lead us off and to discuss the athletic program at Williams. He played in 13 consecutive alumni basketball games after the age of 55, spoke to many and several of the athletic teams and taught several years during winter study. Ted, please lead us off. Thank you, Larry. Williams College sets the gold standard in integrating excellence in academics and amateur athletics. First, we know amateur athletics create significant life skills as stated metaphorically by the Duke of Wellington that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Three proven ways of breaking down barriers among people are performing challenging work together, serving in the military, or playing on a team. Amateur athletics are simply an applied laboratory for becoming a good competitor by naturally going far beyond the comfortable and familiar, gaining the will and discipline for achieving a valuable result, developing the grit for not giving up, and being a good teammate in all endeavors. In short, lots of learning begins every day at four o'clock in the afternoon at Williams College and has for generations. Second, what differentiates Williams in integrating excellence in academics and amateur athletics are coaches as mentors, culture, and continuity of purpose. Coaches at Williams know their X's and O's and are passionate about their sport. Every varsity head coach understands the priority of academic excellence. Each head coach has full standing as a member of the faculty, attends faculty meetings, and includes an academic faculty advisor assigned to each team. Williams coaches are expected to win, as evidenced by winning 22 out of 24 Directors' Cups, which is a byproduct, not an annual goal. Coaches and players have won 38 Division III national titles in 11 different sports and 183 NESCAC championships. Why else choose to compete other than to win? 
The culture in which coaches operate at Williams includes the division of the day, meaning classes and laboratories end by four o'clock and athletics don't start before four o'clock. Many Williams student athletes play two sports. Numerous players volunteer to teach in local schools and many teams include physically challenged youngsters from the impact program on their roster. Employers around the world recognize the multifaceted attributes of Williams student athletes, particularly people in our widespread Williams alumni network. Importantly, athletics at Williams are both effective and cost efficient. The annual athletic budget at Williams is $10.5 million, or only 14,000 per each of 750 varsity athletes on 32 teams, about a third of all students. Only 66 that are recruited athletes, of which 14 of those are football players. These figures compare to an athletic budget at the Division I University of Michigan of $200 million or 220 or 220,000 per each of 900 recruited varsity athletes, hence only 3% of 30,000 students participating. There is a cataclysmic shift in Division I university sports from threats to the integrity of the games from online betting, compensation of athletes for name, image, and likeness, athlete transfer portals, on-demand content distribution, all chasing big money. This shift further differentiates the sustaining value of Williams College's excellence at academics and amateur athletics. Of course, many additional Williams students play recreational and club sports. But please understand, my relationship with Williams College is not rooted in nostalgia, rather the expectation that Williams College perpetually improve as a center of excellence, developing young men and women capable of changing the world. I have watched countless men and women's teams from Williams compete across America since we graduated, taught winter study programs on campus, mentored over 100 Williams students and several coaches, and developed trusted relationships with five presidents of Williams College. I can assure you that Williams has sustained its continuity of purpose regarding athletics. I consider it quite normal meeting our classmate, Bill Taylor, his driving from South Carolina and I flying from Dallas to Greensboro, North Carolina, watching the Williams women's soccer team win a national championship. I have seen Williams men's basketball win a national championship in Salem, Virginia, and women's tennis capture national championships in San Antonio and Fredericksburg. Occasionally, someone may ask if athletics are too prominent at Williams. I reject that premise since every athlete is qualified academically for Williams. There is no opportunity cost or misallocation for admitting students, for admitting an athlete versus a scientist, given Williams' mission of changing lives. So-called white privilege is a false narrative since rosters reflect Williams' diverse, inclusive, and accessible nature. Parties can be a disruptive reality in off-campus housing containing affinity groups of athletes. The key risk against which Williams guards is not allowing the student body to dissolve into isolated populations of any composition. I value the life skills learned playing 29 seasons of interscholastic and intercollegiate athletics, creating an inveterate fabric to my varied professional life. As a military wartime intelligence officer, corporate executive, longtime innovative entrepreneurial business owner, presidential appointee twice confirmed by the United States Senate and adjunct teacher at Williams. Athletics shaped my character as a self, as a source of self-command, self-reliance, courage, and joy. One final story. My mother grew up in New England, graduated from Smith College, followed by Yale Law School in 1935. Mother never shared my love of organized sports and she treated every one of my 29 seasons with polite indifference. Larry, please put up on the screen the picture of our 1967 Williams baseball team. Thank you. Her attitude changed dramatically our senior year at Williams 
when 12 of my baseball teammates, shown here, stayed overnight twice in our house in Washington, DC, the midpoint of our spring trip from Williamstown, playing ball for two weeks in North Carolina. Coach Bobby Coombs, a Duke graduate from Maine and former major league pitcher, absolutely charmed her with his love of New England and Southern courtesy. At Duke, he was an All-American baseball player for three years in a row and later pitched for the Philadelphia Athletics. Coach Coombs spent 28 years at Williams as baseball coach as well as freshman basketball coach before retiring in 1973. In 1987, the new baseball field at Williams was named for him. Larry, you can take that picture off now, thank you. For years after my teammates stayed overnight at our house in Washington, my mother, still knowing nothing or caring nothing about sports, elevated her status among her elderly contemporaries in Washington by regaling them with about, quote, the delightful men from Williams just kept coming in, some sleeping on couches on the third floor. And oh my, thankfully I had extra platters of roast beef and turkey. Those boys ate everything. And you wouldn't believe the thank you notes each of them sent me from around the country. She would finish by stating, quote, you may not be aware, my friend, that the Williams College baseball team's record in 1967 was an excellent 15 wins and nine losses, a 63% winning percentage, or that my good friend, Coach Bobby Coons, gave up the longest home run Babe Ruth ever hit. Now, back to you, my friend Larry Ricketts, whose excellent curveball and self-proclaimed ability for, quote, thriving under pressure, earned Larry an undefeated career record of seven wins and no losses pitching for Williams College. I muted myself. Thank you, Ted. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, and Get ready to unmute yourself, Steve Orr. Uh, during the preparation of this Zoom little journey, it involved a lot of research and discoveries of the talents of our mentors. Steve Orr is going to give you a little different take and how he's going to tell you how special Coach Plansky was as a coach, a person, and an amazing athlete on his own. Steve? Can you hear me? We can. Good. Uh, it's amazing. My four years of cross country and track with Coach Plansky was one of my highlights at Williams. If I had known then what I know now about what he did and his amazing athletic endeavors, it would have made our conversations that much more interesting. I knew him when he was uh, 60, 64 through 67 in, in years because he was born in 1900 and he always had a, a gimp in his leg. And so he was not overly athletic at the time. Uh, he was not a rah-rah type of coach. He was always laid back. And at that time, I wish he had been more aggressive. Yet he knew at a D3 division college, sports were not a life nor death situation, but more, of one's enjoyment, more for one's enjoyment. On a minor side, he knew that cross-country runners must enjoy pain. How else? Why else would they do it? I thought the right word was masochistic until I looked up how to spell it and learned his definition deriving, deriving sexual gratification through one's own pain or humiliation. So I don't use that word anymore. Cross, coaching cross country, he primarily set up practices that left us mostly as a group on our own and didn't see the need to work us to the nth degree as many other coaches did. We were at Williams to enjoy and learn from the many different options and the classes we had he would often ask each of us how we are doing outside of sports. I had always heard, I don't even know where, that Tony had been a good athlete, but I never heard him talk about it. I only wish we had had Google back then. Some of you might remember the name of Lou Little, a famous Columbia football coach. He once said that Anthony Tony Plansky was the greatest athlete he had ever seen, with Jim Thorpe coming in number two. Um, I have no information on his high school athletic career, but is, it is interesting to note that in 1931, he started his career at Williams, taking a position as an assistant track coach. 
at Georgetown, uh, you wonder is why not a football coach? At Georgetown, where he went to college, he was an All-American fullback. After Georgetown, he played football for two years for the New York Giants. And in 1929, he was an All-American fullback. I'm, I'm sorry, at Georgetown, he was an All-American fullback. Then he went to the pros. Uh, and uh, starting 1928, 1929, he was all pro, leading the league and scoring nine touchdowns. In one game against the Green Bay Packers, he scored all of the Giants' 31 points in a 31 to nine win. In a game against the Chicago Bears, he kicked a 60-yard field goal and drop-kicked the 35-yard field goal with three seconds left to win the game 22-21. By the way, the other all-pro running back that year was Red Grange. The next year, he suffered an injury that ended his football career except for a brief stint with the Boston Braves in 1932, now known as the, the Washington, quote, football team. Redskins, we don't mention. So why... Why was he a track coach? Why wasn't he hired as an assistant football coach? Uh, a tough question. Well, when the football season ended at Georgetown, he went out for track, and his event or events was or were the decathlon. He was the national decathlon champion in 1924. He won the Peel Pen Relays three times in the decathlon, ending in 1928. He was the favorite to be the Olympic champion in 1928. But due to a misunderstanding that the winner of the Penn Relays that year got an automatic spot, he never got to go. He was the champion that year. He never got to go. And thus, all of a sudden, he turned to his pro football career. One can see the difference in athletics then and now with coach taking an assistant coaching job. The mighty dollar was not there. With no football and track, he then moved on to a sport he was not known at, uh, semi-pro baseball. In his first year, he hit 376 in Scranton and then played with Buffalo in the International League with a brief stint with the Philadelphia Phillies. After that, he played in the Cape Cod League in the summers. I don't know how he worked the calendar to do all this, but that's beside the point while, it's, while being at Williams. There, he was an all-star five years running. Uh, for a couple of years, he was the, a player manager. And in 1936, batted 337 and led his team to the title as both player and manager. It was said he was the oldest and most popular player of the league during the 30s. Did we know any of this? No. I would see coach practice sometimes on the golf course with four clubs and shooting around par. I gather he used to play in many of the Massachusetts amateur golf tournaments and was known for making sure his ball was on the shady side of the fairway. He did not like the sun. Actually, he had also been on the Georgetown golf team. Another aside, he was also known to be a very good tennis player, and he was an amateur boxer for a while. One of his pro football teammates said he could go far, but he just wasn't mean enough. Rumor has it in his 50s, he was giving tips to a hammer thrower on the track team, and in a demonstration, easily broke the school record. I would have loved to have known all this, but from his point of view, we were at Williams for a broad education looking forward, not backwards, and athletics were only a part. The only time he maybe went out on a limb for me was in the Lehman Cups competition, which most people don't know anything about, but it was a pentathlon open to all students at the end of the season. I may be wrong, but I think he may have favored me in the selection of the five track events he would pick each year. He, he hid my lack of speed. For two years, it worked well. But my senior year, I hate to say it didn't matter due to being tripped on the indoor track at the top of the old gym, creating a stress fracture, which for me meant no running for six weeks. There is no event selection that he could do to make up for the 20 pounds I gained in those six weeks. I think that being around such a calm and laid back coach helped me set the right priorities in life, families, friends, helping others. My three children are all fairly athletic, each participated in high school and college sports without parental intrusion. After Williams for me, it was OCS and three weeks, three years as a supply officer, then mine, sorry, then nine months traveling around Europe and Asia, getting rid of my wanderlust, as the Navy only showed me Newport, Norfolk, Halifax, Bermuda, and Guantanamo Bay, where I was discharged. I went back for Williams for job guidance, and the comment was, banks are hiring. 
I became an investment advisor in New York City, met my wife, Jane, how lucky I was, three kids, two banks, a small investment firm, and then on my 50th birthday, a headhunter, a headhunter called about a company called ACO in Albany, an investment company. We have been in Albany now for 26 years with a small house in Booth Bay Harbor. Life has been good. I retired in 2007 after Goldman Sachs bought ACO and decided they didn't really want someone in Albany picking stocks or investments. <laughs> Family still remains everything. On Coach Plansky, I should note that he had someone named George Steinbrenner on his track team, graduated in 1952, and who after the coach's death in 1978 was instrumental in having a new track built and named after Coach Plansky. Uh, as a person, one of the amazing things, I don't know how people find these things out, but he dated his wife, Betty, for 10 years, traveling 140 miles to see her. She, her, she had several siblings. When her mother died, she felt it was her obligation to stay until they all grew up. And therefore, Tony commuted 10 years, 140 miles, umpteen times. Now, I forget where I read this, but I just read it and found it, but don't know the source. Someone in the, was a freshman at Williams, got to PT class early, and there was Tony at the half court line, drop kicking basketballs into the basket. I can't believe that, but the guy then says 90% of the time, that's the part I can't believe. But anyway, he was a great um, person to watch. I just wish I'd known all these other things. It was amazing how, I guess, how humble he was and how you wish that most are. <laughs> Our people would be humble too. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. Thanks, Steve. You know, it does show you with the mentors in our lives, and it's not too late. We often do that, don't know that much about them as people. They're all about helping us. All right. Uh, Dave Riker. Dave was skiing captain and will tell us about Ralph Townsend and other mentors who helped guide quite a career and quite a few life adventures. David? Thank you. Now, shifting from uh, the track and athletic field to the mountains, uh, set the tone with a view of the 67 ski team. We recognize a few of the folks. And even in those days, skiing was a year round training. Here we were taught in Little Red on. Uh, near Mount Mansfield. My own story starts with a kitchen timer in the mid fifties. I developed a snowshoe course in the extensive fields behind our house in Middlebury. I recorded laps with my mother's kitchen timer. One day when I thought I was setting a personal best, I returned to find she had taken the timer back to the kitchen. I was devastated. Little did I understand the athletic and competitive foundation I was inadvertently building. Fast forward a decade, I was at Williams and on this fellow's ski team, Ralph Townsend, or Kochi as we called him, 1948 Olympian, 10th Mountain Division veteran, professor at Williams for 22 years as ski team coach and athletic club director. He was short, but stood tall among the Eastern ski coaches. He taught us to angulate on every turn and to avoid being a dubberdo. He insisted that we study and was firm with behavior standards. And his brother Paul joined us most weekends to help with the waxing. 1965, I'd had a good season and qualified for the NCAA meet at Crystal Mountain, Washington. Ralph took me because he knew I'd screw up, which I did, but I learned an important lesson about big races as he intended. By the way, I never counted, but I think it is fair to say that I spent more time with Kochi during my Williams years than with all other professors combined. And I suspect that I spent more time with the wonderful band of brothers on the ski team than with the rest of our class. Fast forward again to the early 80s. I taught physics and mountaineering, 
run a boarding school dining hall and experience the MBA process at Harvard. Having never taken a writing course at Williams, I was naturally earning my living writing case studies. One of those was on a small company in Oregon called Nike, of which I'd never heard. A year and a half and 14 cases later, I was invited to join the company. Why? I don't know. But a lot of it was due to this guy, Bill Bowerman, legendary track and field coach at the University of Oregon, 10th Mountain Division veteran, 1972 Olympic coach, and the professor of competitive response who taught Bill Knight and many of the early culture shaping Nike employees. Because of my experience with Ralph, I was a kindred spirit and I will be ever grateful for that invitation. Within Nike, I was fortunate to get grounded in product, the absolute heart of Nike. Over time, I gravitated to the people world with a focus on management development. In retrospect, my work became an effort to shape thinking about our people and the way we interacted in the belief that this represented a sustainable source of competitive advantage. This is Bob Waddell, president when I joined the company. He described the culture in these paragraphs from the case study. I'll give you a a minute to read this. The issue is the issue. The issue is the issue, so critically important and yet so hard to achieve. As the company grew over the decades, this became more and more difficult and I can't imagine what it is like now, but we invested a ton in getting people together face to face so we'd know each other and in hiring people who are competitive, smart, confident, and humble. As Bowerman taught Knight, as Kochi, taught us. But what happened to skiing? As I left Williams, I found what I really enjoyed was the competition more than the skiing itself. We'd done a lot of hiking for our ski training, and for me, that hiking turned vertical. I had some first experiences with rock climbing while at Williams, but my subsequent time at Oxford introduced me to the deep history of that sport in North Wales and the Alps. I became hooked. Many years later, I had the opportunity to climb El Cap in Yosemite with a guide. This goal had emerged during a 1988 visit to the valley. We were from a climb on Middle Cathedral and saw headlamps high on El Cap. What an incredible experience that would be, I thought. Seven years later, after a lot of hard work and good fortune, I had that experience. It was indeed incredible. And it closed a nice loop for me. During my many, many hours with Kochi, he had helped me come to grips with relinquishing my goal of skiing in the Olympics and instead choosing to continue through college. This was the right thing to do, and I am deeply grateful for his patience and counsel in helping me recognize it. And so it meant a lot many years later to set and accomplish a goal that had significant meaning for me and it had become the right thing to do. I think Kochi smiled as we topped out on the Salathe wall. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, and uh, I really appreciate it, my friend. Um, amazing, amazing story. Um, David Nash had an amazing athletic career after college and Coach Chafee was his inspiration. So David, tell us a little bit about your experiences. Well, can you hear me? We can. Good, okay. If you uh, run out of voice, David has a little no, voice, but let me I'm know. Good. I'm good. Okay. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in to hear the seven of us talk about our Williams coaches and mentors and the impact they had on our lives. 
We have all had Williams mentors, professors, administrators, junior advisors, senior students, and coaches. Many of us have had more than one mentor, which I certainly did. I finally remember Fred Rudolph and Bobby Cohns, who was our freshman basketball coach. Another mentor for me was John Paulus, the basketball and tennis coach at the University of Wisconsin. He was not only my coach, but a lifelong friend. He did die this last summer. However, Clarence Chafee was the most influential as he was around in my formative, formative years. So who was Clarence Chafee? He was born in 1902 in Rhode Island. He had a BA from Brown University, an MA from Columbia, and an MA from Williams. He was hired in 1937 to be the squash, soccer, and tennis coach at Williams. He retired in 1970 after 33 years. Was he successful? You bet he was. His tennis one loss coaching record was 171.97 after playing a tough sketch that included Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, Princeton, and Army. It seemed like every year his tennis and squash teams won the little three championships. He was a legend in the tennis world. He was elected to the New England Tennis Hall of Fame. The esteemed broadcaster, Bud Collins, called him his favorite, favorite player. Every year, the NESCAC presents a sportsmanship award in his name. His greatest successes, however, came after he left Williams in 1970. He won 41 national championships in his 16 years of playing senior tennis. In 1981, he won the Grand Slam at age 80 of the indoor, the clay, the grass, and the hard court national championships. That same year, he had a new pacemaker installed. And it was reported that before the procedure, he told the doctor not to screw up his serve. So what was he like? He was a gentleman sportsman. As a coach, he always wore a coat and tie. He was dignified. There was never a disparaging comment about any of our opponents or teammates, win or lose. If you won, don't gloat. If you lost, no excuses. His philosophy was to give 100% and then let the chips fall as they may. As a teacher, he loved to offer ideas on how to improve your performance. Those were all lessons we live by and valued later in life. He was also a friend you could trust, somebody you could talk to. And I received letters from him when I did well in national tournaments. He always had a positive attitude. He was a strong competitor who wanted to win, but his highest priority, sportsmanship, and he never allowed his players to act up. Two of his players that I'm sure you all know, Peter Grossman and Tom Thornhill were in pre-med pre classes and had labs that caused them to miss many practices. Chiefy never complained because sports always came second. Chiefy had several favorite sayings. One is from Rudyard Kipling. It stands above the door as you go on to center court at Wimbledon. It says this, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those imposters just the same. I think that's wonderful. Of course, he liked our own climb high, climb far. Your goal is sky, your aim is star. Well, how did Clarence impact my life? I was an average player at Williams. Tennis was not big in Minnesota and the weather met for a short season. I knew if I wanted to play, I'd have to get better. And Chafee always encouraged his players to improve their games. And if you did so, it could become a sport for a lifetime. In 1978, I won the Northwest sectional and he sent me a very nice letter of congratulations. He encouraged me to go play some national tournaments, which he said would be well worth it and I would probably do well. Needless to say, I was very skeptical, but I thought, well, maybe I'll try this. So in 1982, I decided to play my first national, the 35 indoors in St. Louis. I remember thinking before my first match, just win one game. To my surprise, I won two matches. And three years later in 1985, I won my first national championship on grass. I beat a former number one US player, Whitney Reed. So here's a good curiosity for you. Two years later, Peter Grossman, playing in the same tournament, met Reed in the quarterfinals. Peter asked me how to play him. I said, well, what do you think Chafee would say? He'd tell you to play your game. Let him figure you out. 
needless to say, Peter won. I think Chafe would have been proud to have two of his former players defeat a former number one championship player. Once again, I got a very nice note from another win. He died a year later, which is a very sad day in my life. I now have won over 40 national championships, and but moreover, played tennis all over the world in team matches. I was fortunate enough to play on 12 U.S. national teams, and we won five world team championships. In 85, I was inducted into the Minnesota Tennis Hall of Fame. It was a proud moment as Billie Jean King and John Paulus were there for the presentation. Throughout my tennis career, Linda and I traveled all over the world for matches, including Great Britain, Germany, France, Austria, Spain, Croatia, Australia, Chile, Canada, Mexico, and South Africa. I was fortunate enough to play three, three times at Wimbledon, which was a real treat. We met many great people who we continue to stay in touch with through social media. We also never missed a museum in a lot of these places where we traveled thanks to the Williams Art Department for giving us good training. But this all went back to Chafee and his encouragement and faith in me, as well as his training. In my business career as a banker, I tried to apply much of what he stood for because those values are transferred. And he helped me be successful in my business dealings, friendships, and competition. He was an amazing man, and I've lived a good life thanks to a Williams education and a mentor like Clarence Chafee. Thank you all of it, to all of you for listening. I hope you found these presentations interesting. It was a great, fun project to think back to those days of Williams and the people who impacted your life. Larry, back to you. Thanks, David. I wish you would have called me up to carry your bag on some of those trips. That's all I know. <laughs> um, I have to tell you an anecdote that was written by Tom Phelan, who couldn't attend tonight to Alan Stern. Um, apparently, Tom, either in the spring or fall, chose tennis as one of those, uh, you know, compulsory phys ed programs we had to take. And he arrived down on the tennis courts, hearkening back to his days with gym teachers, and he saw this older man calling the role. And let's use uh, the fictitious name. He was calling George Scott. Nobody answered. George Scott. Nobody answered. The third time Chafee called out George Scott and some voice said, it's me. Chafee walked out, looked him in the eye and said, it is I, son. How did you get into this college? And <laughs> Tom said he was sitting there shaking, saying, oh, my goodness, the gym teachers even correct our English. <laughs> That's, I thought it was a, Tom wanted a, us to tell that story. So thanks, Tom. Uh, John Stableford, hockey captain, and knows how important Bill McCormick was because John was a coach in his career. So John, are you there? Unmute yourself. And there you are. Okay, take it away. I am, thanks Larry. And so nice to see you everybody. It's an amazing sight to see so many faces. Nobody's changed. <laughs> I was recently surprised to realize that over my varsity career and goal at Williams, we won just half our games. It's true we played a lot of division one teams in those days, games we were unlikely to win but the overriding feeling I have from those years is one of success. And I can trace this feeling back to coach Bill McCormick. Bill absolutely loved hockey and every day he modeled this in the way he coached. He skated drills with us. And when we scrimmage and someone was missing from a line, he'd jump in and take that person's place on a shift. My high school coaches were all yellers. Some played favorites and occasionally humiliated players, but Bill never did anything like that. I never heard him yell or even get mad. Well, maybe once. Senior year in a away game at the University of Vermont, uh, where the refs kept putting people in the penalty box and we were down pretty much the whole game. We managed to win it, but he got heated in that game and actually took me out of the game. Um, we were winning by four goals and he wanted to win by five, by, so he pulled the goalie. That's the only time I ever saw him do anything like that. He held us to a high standard with his mild manner and his keen focus. And no one wanted to disappoint him. If we played a sluggish period, 
he'd pace a little in the locker room and say, I don't understand why you guys don't skate every shift as if, as if it were the last one you'd ever play. He may have been calm and underspoken, but I also remember him running out onto the ice at the buzzer to celebrate a spectacular win with the team. You will remember that our late classmate, Peter Hart, was also a goalie. After a week of practice freshman year, I was certain I was the better of the two of us, but it was impossible to tell what Bill was thinking. One day between drills, I asked how he thought we stacked up. And he replied, I'm just waiting for one of you to act like he's won the job. It was a cue I needed and a valuable lesson. For the next four years, I started in goal every game but one when I was in the hospital. But his words told me I'd have to earn that start each week, that week in, in practice. After graduate school, I began a career as a teacher and a coach that lasted 43 years. And for more than half of them, I coached hockey, always with Bill in mind as a model. I even used some of the drills I'd learned at Williams. Gradually though, my teaching transitioned away from hockey to cross country and track, following a passion I had developed for my own competitive running, uh, particularly marathons and mountain races. Strange as it may seem, Bill's influence on how I coach was even greater than it had been in hockey. With runners, it's important to see them as individuals with strengths and quirks that have to be understood for them to fully develop their talents. I trained entire teams, but I made subtle adjustments for individual athletes the way Bill had done for me at Williams. Early in my varsity career, Bill heard me complaining about the way uh, the man who sharpened our skates did mine, handled mine. Um, I liked them really sharp and hollow ground, not flat ground and dull like most goalies in that era. Bill had a simple solution. He saw that I got trained in, at the sharpening wheel. And from then on, my skates were my responsibility. Sharpening my own skates became a game ritual for me. It gave me confidence and I think it helped my play. One final point. Bill taught us to be humble and to respect our opponents. Often enough when a game was over, you'd see him shaking the hand of someone on the opposing team who had played particularly well. At the end of my senior year, Bill presented me with a certificate indicating I had made all East. He congratulated me, then whispered that he thought the Middlebury goal it should have been honored as well. He wasn't diminishing my achievement, he was putting it in perspective. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, John. That's, that's a great story with a great coach. Uh, finally, we complete the comments with two swimming co-captains. This will go full circle back to Ted's first comments. Rick Williams will first tell us about a giant, Bob Muir. And then Bob Conway will then talk about Carl Samuelson, who took over our senior year as swimming coach. Samuelson became an equal legend and continued in Bob's tradition, but also forged women swimming at Williams. In fact, he allowed women to swim on the men's team and had to fight for that around New England when he did it. The swimming pool at Williams is named after both of these men. So go ahead, Rick, unmute yourself and I will put the share screen and tell me when you want this. Well, start with the first one. You want me to start with this one? Absolutely. <laughs> just remember me the way I was because that's the way I like to see myself now not the old man I see in the mirror anymore <laughs> uh, put up the second one please. pardon put up the second one please I'm going to talk about Bob Muir and I, I think uh, most of you know he was our coach for the first three years that we were at Williams and most of you probably remember him he was that uh old guy with a Marine haircut and a very heavy Boston accent. But he was a lot more than that. Uh, put up the next one, please, Larry. Um, I don't know whether you can read that or not, but I'll summarize it. He, he had a great career uh, and it was summarized when he was in, in, inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1989. Uh, per his accent, he was a Boston boy born in 1898 and he spent the th first 38 years of his life there, including acquiring a wife, my own. He was a uh, YMCA national record holder for a number of years. And then he was a swimming coach at various wise clubs. And in the 1920s, he was a swimming coach at both Boston University and MIT. 
From 1930 to 36, he was the freshman swimming coach at Harvard. He came to Williams in 1936 and stayed until 1966. He was an assistant Olympic swim coach in 1948 and 1952, and the head coach in Melbourne Olympics in 1956. At Williams, he was very successful. His Williams record was 185 wins, 44 losses, and four ties. They won, we won 17 New England championships, and he had 27 undefeated seasons. Put up the next one, please. Right. His impact was a lot more than a resume. Uh, this is a letter that was written by President Kennedy one month into his presidency uh, on the occasion of Bob's 25th anniversary as a coach at Williams. And the fact that he would do that and the personal note of it shows that Bob had a memorable impact on everyone from the president on down. Uh, he coached uh, President Kennedy his freshman year at Harvard. But Bob was more than a, a teacher than he was a coach and he saw himself that way. There's a quote in uh, Sports Illustrated, Faces in the Crowd thing, if you remember that from Sports Illustrated in 1961, where Bob said, I would rather get a child started the right way in the water then turn out an All-American. I thought him as a decent, gentle man, but not necessarily a great coach. And that shows what an arrogant college kid doesn't know. The older me knows that the essence of coaching is instilling values and improving lives, which he did in spades. I remember him most proud, being most proud, not of his best swimmers, but of those who tried the hardest and then improved, who stuck with it. An example in our class was Neil Coughlin. He used to always refer to him as his favorite. He also was always invigorated by his time with his beloved wife, I own, teaching kids in the summer at the Lawrence Beach Club during the summer. For 50 years, he did that. I got a glimpse of the real man in December of 1965, when Bob got me invited to swim at a college all-star meet at the opening of the International Swimming Hall of Fame in Fort Lauderdale. I was surprised that a small school swimmer was even invited. That obviously was Bob's doing. What I learned about him there was really stuck with me. Everybody there knew him and respected him, not just as, not just as a person, but as another coach. I remember him introducing me to the three in the picture here, all inaugural inductees and Olympic, most of them multi Olympic gold medalist. Johnny Weissmuller, Tarzan, Duke Kahanamoko, who was the father of modern surfing as well as an Olympic champion and participated in four Olympics, the last one since he was too old to swim on the water polo team. And Buster Crabb, Flash Gordon and Tarzan 2.0. I expected a one minute hello, goodbye um, when he introduced us, but they all wanted to talk to him and spent five to 10 to 15 minutes with us. After the first two left, Buster Crab stayed and talked swimming with Bob. One of the things he said is how good the kids were today and how good the coaching was. And then he lamented that he had never learned how to do a flip turn. Bob said, well, Rick's good at that, he'll teach you, which I did for the next 30 to 45 minutes. By the way, he got it perfectly. He was still a great athlete at 60. Overall, I was in awe of the respect that these legends had for my coach. Reflecting back on the impact he had on me, I now realize that the values and actions that he showed me made a very, very deep impression. To sum up Bob in his own words, I think that says it best. Upon retiring from Williams, he was asked if he would miss it. He said, no, for then I can spend my full time teaching kids. Thanks, Larry. Now I wanna turn it over to my co-captain, Bob Conway and our, our senior year swim coach, Carl Samuelson. And every bit, I'm every bit as thin as I was in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Just in my legs. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. 
Bob finishes yeah. it up and then we'll go to breakouts and and we probably uh, will spend most of the time in breakouts and just come back quickly after breakouts for an ending. So Bob, go ahead. Thanks, Larry. Um, I, I'm, I'm also just as skinny as I was then. <laughs> and it's because I still swim. Um, swimming is a sport like, I suppose, tennis and golf and a few others where you're not limited by your age. And I swim in a pool uh, east of Oakland where I'm probably in the middle of the age group. There are a lot of people who are younger and at least as many who are older. Um, so it's inspiring every time I go three or four times a week um, to stay in shape. I wanna pick up where Rick left by recounting something that Bob Muir told us when we were freshmen. He, he said, these should be your priorities while you're here. Number one, your health. Number two, your studies. Number three, your swimming. And number four, your social life. I was stunned when he said that. I expected swimming to be number one. But of course, like most of us then, I had those values inverted. So social life was the most important and health was the least. But I thought some guy who was such a star as a swimming coach and a swimmer could put his primary activity as a coach in third place. And that's something I've tried to remember ever since. He also said in the same vein, if you treat your body well, it ought to last a lifetime. And uh, that's turning out to be true, I think. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> it's sort of a cliche, I think, of the business world or the political world that the true value of a leader, of a CEO or a president, is shown in what happens after that person leaves in the next three or four years. And in that regard, Bob was a champion as he was in everything else because he recruited Carl Samuelson from Springfield to come to Williams. I can't imagine bigger shoes to fill and Carl filled them almost immediately and then sustained over his long career himself. Our class of 67 at Williams was, was odd in the sense that the class of 66 was fantastic. They had a whole group of really, really good swimmers. And we had only one, and that's Rick. The rest of us were mediocre at best. And while I had uh, pretensions of being a scholar at college, uh, I had a very faint fantasy of being an athlete, and I've never considered myself one. So I must have been one of those guys that coaches like who keep on plugging away, even though you're not very good and you never give up. The reason I was a co-captain was because after the last meet, which was at Bowdoin, I believe, an away meet, um, the co-captains and, and the seniors uh, of class of 66 decided that co-captains was a safer bet than a single captain. They made a mistake. Rick should have been the single captain of our team. Um, he was the, 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 uh, the best swimmer by far of any of us. But anyway, I got elected. And so um, I went back and tried my senior year and I wasn't planning to. So that was sort of a rude awakening for me. Anyway, to get on to Carl. I swam the butterfly and no one ever since I started swimming competitively when I was about 10, ever taught me anything about it. I just faked it. But Carl did. Carl showed us underwater films of swimmers, butterflyers. And it was a revelation to, to see what a stroke looked like under the water. It's something that you can't see yourself when you're swimming. And there were some key maneuvers of that kind of a stroke. I assume Rick knew this all along, but I sure didn't. And just learning those from Carl allowed me to improve my time by a huge margin so that by the end of senior year, I felt like I wasn't so much of a fraud. Carl also said something 
that stuck with me like Bob's four priorities. He said, be cerebral, which meant in terms of swimming, that you put your attention in the fore of your head rather than back here in your medulla. And I've tried to keep that as a, as a, as a saying that to guide my life. And when you're in the middle of a race or standing on the box before the race starts, your emotions run high. You tend not to be at all rational. Your adrenaline is pumping like crazy. And if you don't focus on what you're doing as you swim, you're going to do poorly. And I swam that way for the first three years and until Carl told me to be cerebral. And that has changed my swimming and the rest of my activities in other parts of my life. And when I swim laps now, I try to ignore all the other swimmers. I still want to beat them, but I can't. Uh, and I try to stay cerebral with the focus of my attention in the top of my forehead. Um, I want to give a shout out to the other swimmers from our freshman year who are here today. Um, Niall Coughlin, Donnie Brown, Ken Levison, and particularly Rich Bernstein. Rich, I don't think he swam past sophomore year, maybe not past freshman year. Yet he became a national champion in the hardest race you can think of, the 1650 freestyle. We didn't even have that race when we were at school. Our, our longest distance was 500 yards. Rich is still a serious competitor and probably one of the finest athletes in our entire class. Thank you, sir, Larry. Thanks. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm going to change up a little bit here. Number one, um, because people entered late, there may be a few in that don't go in the breakout rooms, but there'll be, I think there are three or four of us will be in the main room. We'll have a discussion. I'm not going to try to equal uh, uh, out, but when I break you in breakout rooms, if Bobo Olson, Paul Lipoff, George Cannon, Rick Ackerley, and Irv Blonde are in one of the rooms, I think I did a fairly good job, but Rick, you're not showing for some reason. Uh, if just please uh, lead the discussion. We'll do breakouts for about 14 minutes. We'll come back quickly and uh, we will not have a discussion because the enthusiasm of our captains was enough for the discussion. So uh, let me take you to breakout rooms. Uh, we have, let me see. So I'm not showing? <laughs> for some reason you're not showing, but we'll see. You may end up, Rick. You may end up in a room, we'll see. In room seven, I only have three now. And once I see, I can send, I think I can figure out how to send. So I'm gonna open all the rooms. You should go in your breakout rooms. There's seven of them. There's only three in the last one, David Nash, Ron Bodenson, and Chris White, but we'll see what we can do. Okay. So can you see me now? Rick, you're left here with, that's good. With, you you got, can see me? Yeah, I can see you. And we've got Irv. Yeah, I'm, I, can, I can see everybody. I'm in now. You're in now? But I'm Why not in the breakout room. No, but that's all right. You're in the main room. Can you see us all in the main room? I can see you. Can you? Well, you might put on gallery view. Marty Samuels, Van Hawn, Mal Getz, Ron Matthews, Rich Gehrman and Rick Ackerley and I are here. Can you guys all see all of us? Uh, unmute yourselves, if you will. Marty, Van, Ron, Rich. Yeah. There you go. I, I, I there we cannot go. see both. Are you, are you on the phone, Van? No. Oh, I'm uh, now. Oh, I am on uh, an iPad, and I think I may get you. What? Yeah, you've got a poor connection. So this says worry. only the host can share or something. So, don't worry. As long as everybody can see or hear. So, Irv, why don't you take over? Then, Rick, yeah. just quickly. Quickly, I, I'm anxious to hear about other mentors at the college. But, Irv, anything you have to say about yeah, I just, coaches uh, and mentors? I'll I'll, I'll lead off and just have a few brief comments, but uh, I would invite others who uh, would like to share 
any experiences they've had with mentors, whether they're coaches or, or professors or anybody else that's affected their career or uh, um, uh, any major life decisions. As far as the basketball is concerned, we had um, Al Shaw was the, was the varsity coach and he was a very good uh, strategist. And he, uh, uh, we were always well prepared. We knew all the, the players' tendencies on the other team. And uh, very rarely were we surprised by anything they did. And he won, I think it was 10 straight uh, little three championships. The, uh, and then our freshman coach was Bobby Coombs, who you've heard about. And he was just a great guy. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved to play for him. And uh, it was uh, uh, our freshman year was really a hoot. If I had to, uh, and reflecting back, if I had to pick one thing, that uh, impacted me the most. It was really sports in general. Uh, I had a legendary high school coach that was probably had more influence on me than any coach I had at Williams, but uh, uh, sports in general, uh, it, it, taught, it taught me to, and it teaches anybody to deal in a, in a group, when you're in a group setting, to try to subordinate your individual uh, statistics and goals to that of the team. And 90% of the time, they're the same, they're parallel. But uh, there's some times where what's best for you individually may not be the best for the team. And the teams that uh, uh, I always found the most successful, they developed a culture, a, a, a chemistry that distinguish them from some of their opponents. Even if they, if their opponents were more skilled, uh, uh, oftentimes the team with the best chemistry uh, prevailed. And uh, I remember a quote- That's why the Cleveland uh, Browns have done so well over the years. Sorry, That's Mark. right. <laughs> well, I remember I saw Bill Russell from the Boston Celtics interviewed one time. And he said, uh, he said when he was a freshman in college, that he had to decide between trying to have individual statistics that were off the chart or uh, play for the team. And he decided the latter and he won two NCAA championships and then he won 10 NBA championships. And he used to have great, great battles with Wilt Chamberlain, who was a much better athlete and probably one of the best athletes of all time. But Russell prevailed and it, it just kind of shows you that the team chemistry and, and uh, culture is uh, so important in any organization. And so translating this to my career, I, uh, I'm a, I retired this past uh, January, but I, I was a uh, commercial real estate attorney and I was with a large firm. I went with them out of law school and uh, um, I, I, I had a commercial real estate practice and wanted to uh, expand it. It was primarily my clients were regional, and I thought that we could it, we could make a uh, uh, a dent nationally. So I talked to some other major firms, and I decided 16 years ago to join a what really smaller firm, 40 lawyers, and uh, it uh, because of the culture, because of the chemistry, and because of the goals. And uh, when I retired last year, we, we, were, uh, we had a thousand lawyers in 17 cities and had the, one of the biggest healthcare practices and one of the biggest real estate practices in the country. Uh, it was the fastest growing firm in the country for five years. So culture and, and uh, chemistry are in any organization, whether it's a charitable organization, any association, to me, that's the, that's the main thing that I've got out of uh, athletics. So I'll, uh, having said that, I'll turn it over to whoever wants to follow uh, up. Malcolm, I'm curious, a mentor that you can, any mentor at Williams College, professor or otherwise? Uh, Gordon Winston uh, in economics uh, was just uh, uh, very important to me. Uh, and uh, I took every course I think he offered. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be like him, uh, and uh, I didn't succeed at that, but uh, I did okay. 
Did you did you did you consider him a friend as well as a teacher? Uh, no, no. But um, uh, in the 1990s, uh, I got an interest in uh, economic issues in higher education, and there was a seminar that uh, went on annually in uh, in uh, Cambridge, and uh, Gordon came in for that, uh, and I was there and uh, got to be his friend. In that uh, in that setting for probably a decade, uh, in that way, yeah. Van, him. can you hear me? Yes. Yes, indeed. Van, how about someone at Williams that you considered a mentor? Well, I I uh, second the thought of uh, uh, Ralph Townsend, who I really only had uh, two years on the ski team, but he was a hell of a guy. And um, and he he'd been all shot to hell in uh, Italy uh, with the Tenth Mountain Division, and and after that managed to come back and be on uh, the Olympic team in 1948, and I think maybe in in 1952 as well, and a very very warm, caring. Um, he obviously one of the issues. Uh, being a ski coach at Williams College is the David Reicherts of the world only come along once or twice in your entire uh, coaching career. So uh, he, he had to do with a lot of guys like Beersack and me who were only, you know, marginal players, but he was a, a, a lovely man and, uh, and a great inspiration. Are you in Colorado now skiing? No, no, no. I I'm in my, you know, country house in Afton, Minnesota, overlooking okay. the St. Croix River. Uh, Rick, Rick Ackerley, we haven't heard from you. Go ahead. Yeah, I would. I completely uh, agree with Irv. I mean, I, and I came away uh, with just the, it was just built into my brain that um, it's the team that does the job and individuals. Um, you know, need to make their contribution, and uh, yeah, I that. It, but it was the culture of Williams College that that uh, did that. The the whole culture it was built in. Um, a lot of great professors. Um, I don't have, you know, I I played hockey and lacrosse, and. Um, I don't even remember the name of my uh, lacrosse coach. <laughs> I, I looked at it once and I forget too. <laughs> <laughs> he was not a great mentor, but um, um, oh gosh, who is the politi great political science professor? Everybody knows one of the best. Bob, uh, Gaudino. Bob Gaudino. Right, Bob Gaudino. He was the best. Um, he was a mentor to so many people. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll tell a story. Um, remember, um, Brian. Um, they named oh gosh he was he was uh into sds and he was a uh, real brian murphy, murphy. Brian, right, murphy. brian murphy he was a, a real uh fist shaker then and still is um uh and we we're together we get together for coffee from time to time here in california he's a great guy um and i'll never forget him getting really mad at, at, in a political senior political science class and he was going on about some you know, a, you know, we need a revolution, and and um, and Bob Gaudino was great. He very calmly he said, "I understand your points; they're really good points, but I don't understand the anger. Tell me about the anger." And it was, I'll never forget that moment. But yeah, Bob Gaudino was great. Um, Bob Parks was terrific. I took uh, um, physics for non majors. One of the best things I did senior year. Um, Anyway, so many great professors, but students, you guys, I mean, it was, you, <laughs> I, why do you think I'm here? It's because I want to see all you guys. It was great. There were 300 of us in that uh, dining room together for a whole year. It mattered so much, it mattered so much. I think, I think that's well said, the support that was given to each other while we were going through a adolescent transition, academic transition, 
uh, and has gone on the rest of our lives. Yeah. So individual yeah. mentors and friends. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, yeah. So many, I, so many people that that are on the screen. Um, yeah, I'm still friends with. We, I still communicate. Uh, I must mention one thing that Irv brought up. Um, I, I, I was a baseball player in in high school, and we were the first team from Tom's River, who's now produced a lot of pro players, that won the state championship the first year we went. And I pitched all five games, and I just got into a mode of competitiveness to win, and I even think I was numb about the sport. And meeting a Cadeau, uh, a Bob Holdridge. Uh, and a group of guys, and then Coach Coombs, who uh, I think turned around my whole attitude towards sports, the understanding, like academics, of the love of the game for the people you were, as Irv said, supporting and competing with, and the fun of the team. Uh, and Coombsy changed my whole life, and I was a little mad at him when I wasn't starting pitcher, and Watson and Ashby and the others were, and he sat me down and he said, you're the perfect personality <laughs> to come in. And he was a relief pitcher. So Coombsy, I never realized how much he liked me to make me a relief pitcher. And as Ted said, I think I came in four games through three years after winning five my freshman year and, and won the whole three. The Asbury Park Press, uh, somebody called me on the phone and we graduated, they featured your graduation and they asked Coombs uh, to comment for some reason and he said he never lost a game in the Williams uniform but more importantly all his teammates had complete confidence and trust in him and it it led through life I think Irv that you're within your group that's the highest compliment that can be paid that the group has trust in you you got their back so hey I'll, I, I'll add a story to that uh, one of the high moments of my life, interestingly enough, was when <clears throat> about uh, 15 of us got together to plan the 45th reunion. That was so much fun. And, and Ron Bodenson, I'll never forget, Ron Bodenson uh, came up with the 45, 67, 67, 45 thing that, that you know, got on our pin. That was just... Uh, that was yeah. just a great moment working with everybody. We worked together so well. I mean, there wasn't any fighting or anything it was great well they're going to get angry with me talk about angry i was told in this preparation when you do breakout rooms there's a way to give an automatic countdown and i forgot to do the three minute countdown i broadcast two things and nobody reads it so when i close the rooms they're going to be mid-sentence and not have a countdown, I, even though I gave them a verbal <laughs> warning. Very so un Once again, I'm my ratings, I, I will get an F rating. But this Shocking. is the last time I'm going to be moderator. So, so here we go. We'll bring everybody back in. Thank, thanks, everybody, for attending. Marty, can you hear us? I'm worried about you. Can you hear us? No, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm just <laughs> listening. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Nice to be here. <laughs> You know how I worry about you, Marty, because you worry about me. I hang on for a minute. Here I close all rooms. Oh, they gave I gave him 10 seconds. See, I didn't give him two minutes. Uh, I want to I want to apologize to the breakout rooms. The, I was warned by Paul Lipoff to be seamless and you have to go down at the bottom and do a cant down. And I forgot, I gave two broadcasts, but once again, I didn't give three minutes where they tick it down. I only gave you 10 seconds. So <laughs> I'm sorry if I cut you off mid, mid sentence. Uh, yeah, I, I want to apologize to Judy for cutting her off in mid sentence. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, Judy. <laughs> I thought it worked <laughs> well, Larry. You can't, you can't do everything right all the time, as, as you all know, especially at this age in life. Um, hey, it was a a final reminder there. before you leave. Thank you. It, it, was, it was great seeing you all, as many people in our group said, half the, uh, the excitement of uh, 
these events. I've been seeing everybody again, and uh, it's great. Uh, a reminder, the next session is February 17th. If you haven't signed up, it just I think it's going to be a fantastic session with Jim Lindheim, Peter Hassinger, and Terry Sands. They'll be discussing their experience in, in writing fiction, uh, fiction to share with others. Uh, if you've ever attempted to write a good story, as many as I've have you want to tune in because most of us start writing a good story it stops and we never do anything with it so i'm i'm very anxious to hear uh the tenacity the strength of will and then getting things published it's going to be quite good so seven o'clock february 17th any last words from huff or alan before we go about our business <laughs> I just want to say uh, and remind everybody about reunion coming up the 12th to the, or excuse me, the 9th to the 12th in June. And love to have as many people back as possible. It really has been fun to have these Zoom events and uh, we're going to continue discussions of this kind uh, during reunion. Um, and it really, I think it'll be a great time. And it's really been nice to see everybody and to be acquainted ourselves with each other and, and just to learn a little bit more about each other. It really has, has just been a great series and we're going to continue this and we're just talking a little bit about continuing beyond reunion too if we if we can uh, do so. So we'll be talking about it but uh, put that on your calendar if you can. And my final good night is that uh, just live and enjoy each day. Um, Huff and I had the privilege of actually talking to Andy Cadeau three or four weeks ago when he could say a few words, Marty Samuels visited him and was able to call us and have us talk to Andy. And uh, it means so much to be a group of comrades and to go through Williams College experience. And it especially meant a lot to Andy. So keep that in mind, live well each day. Good night. Good night. Williams Baseball. Hey, Andy, good Thank good you, Larry. Thank you for organizing, Larry. You did Thank a great you. job. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Thanks, you, Thanks, John. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Thanks so much. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Good night. All right, everybody. Thank you.